Since the days of the New Testament, the church has maintained several official positions of service. Today, we are going to take a short introductory look at the priests, the bishops, and the deacons that make up the group that we know as the clergy. The word clergy traces itself back to an old Greek word that was coined especially for Christian positions of service. Things have developed slightly differently around the Christian world in regards to the clergy. There are differences between the Catholic West and the Orthodox East. Where those differences happen, we are going to look at the Eastern Orthodox approach because we are Eastern Orthodox Christians and so that is our viewpoint. As is the custom on this channel, this video will only introduce the topic to you because there is really too much to explain. If you would like to know more about the clergy, please talk to members of the clergy. The clergy are the leadership of the church, which means that they are simultaneously the servants of the church. When we show them respect, it isn't because we're elevating them into unrealistic divine positions, but because we see in them a representation of Christ and his apostles in leading us closer to God. When you see in Orthodox and in Catholic services, the members of the clergy are wearing vestments and beautiful robes. This isn't because we are showing them undue honor, it is entirely the opposite. It is because the vestments signify the role and different people can fill those exact same vestments. The beautiful vestments aren't there to elevate the person into something greater than a normal human being. They are there to show emphasis on the service that they do to God and for his holy church. The vestments are actually full of symbolic meaning and we aim to eventually do episodes on vestments down the road because there's a lot to talk about just about vestments. When we see a priest wearing these vestments in a church service, we're not really seeing Father so-and-so, we are seeing a priest serving God in the church. The path of the clergy, the life of the clergy, is a life of service. Their job is to look after the non-clergy of the church that's everyone else known as lay people or the laity. The clergy structure is a hierarchical structure. There are several levels or ranks of clergy. Again, this is not based on individual merit. Being good at your job doesn't get you to the next level of the clergy. It is a choice and a calling to do that next level job. We are going to briefly go through the different ranks of the clergy and a little bit about some of their origins. But before we do that, it's worth quickly mentioning the altar servers. When you visit an Orthodox church, you will often see these. They are most often younger fellows and they wear a simple robe called a stikarion and you'll see them carrying candles and doing odd jobs around the church during the service. I mention them because almost every single member of the clergy that you will ever meet was at one point in their life an altar server. The first minor order of the clergy is called the reader. Now the job of the reader is to read. It is a very historical job. We often take the skill of reading for granted, but in ancient times it was not a common ability because there weren't that many books and books were incredibly expensive. The position of the reader came about with the understanding from the church that the person could read well, clearly, and could read it properly without distorting the meanings of the scriptures. It was important that the people heard the scriptures read properly. The position continues now that everyone can read because there is much more to it than simply reading. It is about understanding and studying and living prayerfully and assisting the church in other areas of the community life. During church services, readers often wear a black cassock and in church situations will have the title of reader before their name. It is a position of service and humility, so you won't often see readers using either the cassock or the title outside of church services. During most services, it is the reader that will read from the letters of the New Testament, that is, the books that aren't the four Gospels. In ancient times, the readers actually had even more duties than this, and some of them were actually quite dangerous. One of the duties of the readers in the early church was to look after and protect the very rare and rather illegal Christian text. We actually have a record of this from a non-Christian source, which is a Roman pagan account from the city of Sirta in North Africa, when the Roman governor of that city ordered a raid on a secret Christian church. At that church, they found several different members of the Christian clergy, including a bishop and priests and deacons and subdeacons, but they didn't find the readers because the readers had gone into hiding and they're taking the Christian texts with them. The governor tries to force the Christians there to give up their names and they won't. The Roman text literally ends with the young Christians that are there, the subdeacon saying, we would rather die than give up our friends. There is also a very easy to miss reference to readers 
in the Gospels. In Mark chapter 13, verse 14, in parenthesis, Mark says, let the reader understand. Reading it in the 21st century with the luxury of having a Bible in our hands, we often take this verse as a reference to ourselves, and we should do that. We should read and understand. But remember, most Christians could not read until the invention of the printing press, 1500 years after the Gospels were written. So who was he talking to? It is very likely that Mark is here referencing the readers of the Christian church, which was already established and running, to make sure that they understood what the prophecy was in reference to, and that the readers were doing their due diligence in studying the scriptures. Studying the scriptures and really reading them remains a job of all readers in the Orthodox Church to this day. A reader that wants to reach the next level of service and is called by his priest or his bishop to do so is made a subdeacon. This is the next level in the clergy. The subdeacon often assists in looking after all the altar service and the small jobs that need doing around the church and they will assist in various actions in the community as well. And subdeacons are referenced in that very early text from Serta. The next level up from a subdeacon is the deacon. While the deacon may not be the highest level of clergy, he is absolutely vital to especially big churches. They have a lot to do. The job of a deacon goes back to the very first century and the book of Acts. We already have a video on this channel about the first seven deacons, and the deacons to this day carry on their work. While there are some slight jurisdictional differences on the approach to subdeacon, once a man becomes a deacon in the Orthodox Church, his marital status is really locked in. A man becoming a deacon in the Orthodox Church is either already married or has chosen a life of celibacy. Once a person becomes a deacon, that marital status will never change. Most deacons and priests that you will meet across the Orthodox world are married and with families. Deacons do most of the practical jobs in a church service. They are the ones that lead the entire congregation in communal prayer. They're the ones that keep things going smoothly through the entire service. And it is the deacon that reads the gospel aloud to the people from the front of the church every single Sunday. Within the order of deacons, known as the diaconate, there are different ranks of authority within that. And these are amazing men who are really, really organized. Most deacons are known for having very strong and powerful voices and can be heard without microphones in huge cathedrals. When you ever go to a large Orthodox service where you will see loads and loads of clergy, Pay attention to the deacons and the archdeacons because they will be the ones doing most of the running around, keeping everything operating perfectly smoothly. Deacons are amazing and we always need more deacons. The next step a deacon might take in the church if he feels called by God and by his elders is to become a priest. Orthodox priests do most of the central work of the Orthodox faith and that is the administration of the holy sacraments, the mysteries of the church. This is incredibly important a topic. So I would very much recommend that if you want to know more about that central job of the priest, please talk with the priest. Ask what he does in the Orthodox Church, ask what his job entails, and let him explain and unravel it all for you. Most operating Orthodox Christian parishes have a permanent priest or a permanently assigned priest. Many Orthodox churches do not have a deacon, and when you see that you may think that a deacon is not needed. This isn't exactly the case. If your church has a priest but has no deacon, your priest is in fact doing two jobs simultaneously every single service. This is incredibly difficult and priests really need to be appreciated for that. In fact, we should appreciate all our priests a lot more than we often do. The word priest comes from the Greek word presbyter. Presbyter is the word referenced in the New Testament. It literally means elder. So this word presbyter, priest, is in the New Testament. We've taken it straight from there. Understanding that shows us that the word priest in the English language is one that exists entirely because of the Christian religion and the Bible. In the modern world, however, we actually use the word priest in many different ways. Even though it is a distinctly Christian word, we tend to use it for priests of other religions, we use it in the term of pagan priests, and we use it in the term of Old Testament priests. While New Testament priests have many of the same calling and jobs of the Old Testament priests, they are not the same. There is a distinct difference in the word that we are using. The word presbyter literally means elder. Our Orthodox Christian priests are literally our elders. If you ever read in an English language New Testament, the word elder being used, the word that is being translated from is presbyter, it is priest. And while there are some similarities, there are some differences with what is going on with Old Testament priesthood. Old Testament priests were intermediaries between man and God. 
in the New Testament, Jesus comes down to earth and connects all of us to God. All of mankind, no matter who we are, can speak directly to God. We no longer need intermediaries between us and God, but we do need elders. Understanding this, it makes more sense when we read in the New Testament that the Christians of the church are a royal priesthood. Here, the word is being used in the Old Testament way because all members of the church can communicate directly with God. It elevates all members of the laity in the church to the position of the priesthood. We all participate in the divine liturgy. We all participate in worship together. But teaching us, guiding us, providing us with the holy sacraments are our elders, the priests. We need these jobs to be done and they need to be done by people who have been chosen to do it and who have elected to take upon themselves that cross and that grace of God to do that service. They are helping us to serve God. They are helping us to know God better. The priests of the church today are as essential to us as they have been since the days of the New Testament and as their forebears have since the days of Moses. Interestingly, despite needing priests as much as we do, they are simultaneously one of the least important positions in the clergy because the priest is representing the bishop. The priesthood came about because the original bishops, the apostles, were not plentiful enough to go around. This remains the case today. So when a bishop is at a church, he will do most of the priest's work. The rest of the work is done by the deacons and the priests don't really do that much in that service. So the next step up from a priest is a bishop, and the bishops have also been around since the days of the New Testament. The first bishops were of course the apostles and other notable New Testament figures that began and looked after church communities around the growing Christian world. A priest looks after a church community, a bishop looks after many church communities and their priests. The position of bishop is the final stage of the clergy. Now, you will encounter bishops, archbishops, metropolitans, and patriarchs, but all of them are bishops. They are different administrative levels, they have different levels of authority, but they are all forms of a bishop. A priest will become a bishop to fulfill a need, and a priest that becomes a bishop will be unmarried. Bishops are all celibate in the Orthodox Church. Most of them have been monks and have been in deep service of prayer, and they now take on an extra administrative duty. Overall, that concludes the list of clergy in the Orthodox Church, and within every single one of these ranks of clergy, there are minor ranks and orders and things that make it a little bit more complicated. But these are positions and jobs that have continued since the days of the early church. Saint Ignatius from the first century, a man who studied under the apostles, the very first bishops, reminds us to respect the clergy as we would respect Jesus Christ himself. And that is one of the key things to remember that the clergy are here to help guide us closer and closer to Jesus Christ. They are not doing this for their own glory. They are doing it for his. He is the head of our church and he is the high priest. Thank you for watching. That was a challenging one to put together because there was lots of little pieces and there are so many other little pieces to know. So if you can, please talk to members of the Orthodox clergy to find out more about this. If you get a chance, talk to a bishop about the clergy because a bishop has been all of the previous ranks. We saved up another nice tea for this episode and it is basically Earl Grey tea, but it is a special Earl Grey tea. So a bit of tea story time. There are many different versions of the tale as to how Earl Grey tea came about. It's generally understood that the British Prime Minister Earl Grey visited China and tasted this delicious kind of tea and wanted his tea merchants to make something similar and it became Earl Grey tea, which is black tea with oil of bergamot orange. However, some tea experts think that the tea he originally tried wasn't made with bergamot oil but with a different fruit known as longan. And this tea is a remake of sorts of the kind of tea that Earl Grey may have drunk when he first tasted it. And it is very much like Earl Grey tea, but it feels like it's got more flavor and more fruitiness. And I'm really enjoying it, and it's been a pleasure drinking it with this rather complicated episode.